Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. In the headlines this week, a new study discusses how a major shift in the Earth's magnetic field might have had an impact on prehistoric humans, a new dinosaur has been discovered in Argentina, a rebel Tatooine planet has been discovered, and much more. Our top story this week is a new study that has investigated the changes to Earth's geomagnetic field during an event about 41,000 years ago, when it weakened and the magnetic poles started to wander. The Earth's magnetic field is an integral part of our planet's natural defences, allowing life to exist on the surface as it shields us against solar wind, and the space plasma environment created by the magnetic field offers protection from charged particles and cosmic radiation. Today, the north and south poles of the magnetic field are located near the geographic poles, but at various points in the deep past, the field has fluctuated significantly. The field has completely reversed many different times over the course of the Earth's existence, with the most recent reversal occurring about 780,000 years ago. However, as well as reversals, much more rapid events are known to happen, and these are called geomagnetic excursions. The last one of these was about 41,000 years ago, and was first recognised in the 1960s, being named the Last Champs event. During this excursion, which lasted for about 2,000 years, the field reduced to about 10% of its current strength, and the magnetic poles began to wander away from the geographic poles as the entire field tilted on its side. This new study ran several comprehensive models of the changes to the planet's magnetosphere, and it's the first time that these particular techniques have been used to predict the configurations of the magnetic field during the excursion. Amazingly, the researchers discovered that at certain points, the magnetic poles wandered so far from their modern positions that you would have been able to see auroras at latitudes much closer to the equator. In fact, you'd have been able to watch the aurora borealis in Africa. In addition to these models, the study also discusses the potential impacts the Last Champs event could have had on the prehistoric humans who lived through it. The excursion would presumably have had some serious repercussions for the terrestrial inhabitants of the planet at this time, as more cosmic radiation reaching the atmosphere would have resulted in a depletion of the ozone layer, in turn meaning more UV radiation was reaching the surface. Well, the study notes how the event does coincide with several documented changes in human behaviour and technology that might have been in an effort to reduce UV radiation exposure, especially in Western Eurasia, which would have been particularly at risk. Both Homo sapiens and Neanderthals were living here around this time, with the Neanderthals dying out approximately 40,000 years ago, during the latter part of the Last Champs event. The study notes that around 43,000 years ago, a cultural complex arose among people in Western Eurasia that included the use of ochre, a natural earth pigment, and they hypothesised that its increased frequency in archaeological sites around this time might indicate that it was being used as a sunscreen. Additionally, the cultural complex includes evidence of tools used for making tailored clothing that would have fit the limbs, differing from the clothing style that Neanderthals are assumed to have used, which is thought to have mainly consisted of draped clothing, such as capes. So, the study hypothesises, the ochre sunscreen coupled with this tailored clothing may have given Homo sapiens an edge around this time, as they shielded them from UV radiation, while the clothing also protected them from the cold, unstable climate, and still allowed them full range of motion in the arms and legs. Now, to be clear, the study is not claiming that the Last Champs event was responsible for Neanderthal extinction, which was due to a number of different factors, but it's another interesting potential reason to consider for why Homo sapiens may have had a competitive advantage over our cousins during this time. The study also suggests that further investigations should look at whether or not there might be any connection between Last Champs and the appearance of the oldest known representational cave art around this time as well as early examples of portable art and even musical instruments. As we know, correlation does not always mean causation, but it's nevertheless a fascinating discussion, and it's amazing to consider what impact this geomagnetic event could have had on human evolution. And, as the study also notes, it's an event we really don't want repeating anytime soon, as it would have a massively disruptive impact on our modern communications and satellite technologies. Up next in the news this week, we get to welcome a new species of dinosaur. It's a new kind of long-necked dinosaur, the group known as the sauropods, 
and it was uncovered in approximately 94 million year old rocks in Argentina. It's been named Ciencia Argentina Sanchez I and was unearthed from the Huincul Formation, a geological formation that's famous for being home to one of the contenders for the largest dinosaur to ever live, Argentinosaurus, as well as some massive terrifying predatory dinosaurs such as Mapusaurus. Ciencia Argentina is known from disarticulated fossils representing three individuals, and so altogether we have several vertebrae, ribs, parts of the shoulder girdles and hips, and bits of the hind limbs from this species. Ciencia argentina is a kind of sauropod known as a rebacosaurid, so this marks the fourth rebacosaurid to be uncovered from this formation. Interestingly, this new species was also found to be the most basal of all rebacosaurids, meaning it diverged before all other known members of the group. Ciencia argentina existed only a few million years before the extinction of the rebacosaurids, and so it adds to the accumulating evidence that these long-necked dinosaurs remained fairly diverse right up until their disappearance. A very cool new fossil discovery. In other prehistoric reptile news, an intriguing study has looked at how the crocodilomorphs managed to make it through two major mass extinction events and survive to the modern day. More specifically, the researchers examined how the diets of these reptiles may have helped them to survive the end Triassic extinction about 201 million years ago, and then the end Cretaceous extinction 66 million years ago, when all the non-bird dinosaurs died out. By taking various measurements of the skulls of various crocodilomorphs across time, the scientists were able to compare them with living animals and establish what they were most likely feeding on. Overall, they found that more generalist feeders were more likely to survive mass extinctions, a trend that's also been noticed with mammals. Terrestrial crocodilomorph generalists were the great winners of the end Triassic extinction, diversifying a lot afterwards, whereas it was the semi-aquatic generalists that did better at the end Cretaceous. So it seems that remarkable dietary flexibility has been one of the key reasons for the longevity and immense success of the crocodilomorphs throughout their existence on Earth. And in other news, astronomers scouring the cosmos for star systems may have just discovered one of the most interesting ones yet. In a paper published in Science Advances, they give evidence for the existence of a polar circumbinary exoplanet from a trinary brown dwarf system. Let's unpack that. A brown dwarf isn't technically a star. It's a body that didn't quite have enough mass to start the fusion process, which is what defines a star. However, they're still much bigger than a planet, so they're somewhere in between, mass-wise. The two brown dwarfs at the centre of this system weigh about 35 times more than Jupiter. And yes, that's two brown dwarfs in the centre of the system, but it's actually a trinary star system as there's another brown dwarf very, very far out orbiting the entire system. The exoplanet that we mentioned is a fairly large one, and there's a so-called Tatooine planet because it orbits the two brown dwarfs completely. Weirdly enough, and as if we needed any more of that in the system, this exoplanet orbits the two brown dwarfs in a polar orbit, meaning its orbital plane is at a right angle to the orbit of the two stars. This star system is bound to give us a load of questions about the way our universe works, but hopefully it will help us find some answers too. And getting a bit closer to home now as we once again bring you some news from Mars. A study published this week in the Journal of Geophysical Research Planets has once again looked to the red planet's past, testing two leading hypotheses for the formation of valleys on its surface. Many climate models for early Mars suggest that it could not sustain temperatures warm enough for liquid water on the surface, but the presence of valleys would potentially suggest otherwise. One of the hypotheses tested was that of a warm, wet climate, where precipitation eroded the landscape and formed the valleys. The other was that the valleys formed as ice melted around an ice cap, suggesting Mars had a colder, icier climate. The results of this study suggested that Mars did indeed at some point have a warmer, wet climate, with one of the researchers saying that it's hard to explain the large range of elevations seen in Martian valleys with just melting ice. All this is thought to have happened billions of years ago, at a time when the sun was only about three quarters of the brightness it is today. So how this warmer, wetter climate came about, however, remains a mystery. Also in the recent news, we just have to mention the absolutely incredible first ever recording of a live colossal squid in its natural habitat. The video was captured by a remotely operated vehicle launched in the South Atlantic Ocean at a depth of 600 meters or nearly 2000 feet. Before now, most encounters with colossal squid, which can potentially grow up to 7 meters in length, have only been when they are found as stomach contents in whales and seabirds. So this is a very exciting recording indeed. 
The individual that was filmed is only a juvenile and measured about 30 centimeters in length, or almost 12 inches. This is also why it appears transparent, whereas the adults will eventually lose this transparency. As stated by the scientist who verified the recording, it's exciting to see the first in-situ footage of a juvenile colossal, and humbling to think that they have no idea that humans exist. Truly an unbelievable window into another world. Up next, a recently published paper has outlined how chimpanzees like to share boozy fruit with one another. Traculia africana is a type of tree found throughout Africa, and they produce a kind of fruit called breadfruit. This is a large, dense, and fibrous fruit, and once mature, they drop to the ground and ripen. They also naturally ferment, and the riper the fruit is, the greater the alcohol content is. They still only contain relatively small volumes of alcohol, but the chimps do eat a lot of the breadfruit. Although the quantities of alcohol consumed by the chimps are not enough to make them drunk, as this would be detrimental to their survival, it could be enough to get them a little buzz. Drinking alcohol releases dopamine and endorphins in humans, which lead to feelings of happiness and relaxation. We also know that sharing alcohol helps to form and strengthen social bonds, and scientists are wondering if this is also the case in chimps. Multiple species of African great apes have been recorded feeding and sharing breadfruit, something which researchers say supports the idea that the use of alcohol by humans is not recent, but rather could be rooted in our deep evolutionary history. And finally for the news this week, we have the fascinating report that researchers have just created what they believe to be the largest single chunk of lab-grown meat produced so far. The chunk of artificial chicken meat is about the size of a nugget, and although it isn't yet edible, it's been grown in a very intriguing way. Lab-grown meats have been a thing for years now, and there are a few companies that are in fact selling these meats in certain countries. However, the way the meats have usually been made is by growing small pieces of meat that are then assembled into bigger products, either by printing cells onto a scaffold or gluing small chunks together. But growing a single large chunk seems to be a more desirable method as it will better replicate the texture of natural meats. However, this has proven to be a significant challenge. Now though, these researchers have published the results of their model, which uses a network of many small semi-permeable hollow fibers that provide the cells with nutrients as they grow. This means that much larger pieces can be created as the fibers essentially act like blood vessels to more efficiently supply the cells with nutrients and oxygen. It's a really amazing bit of bioengineering, and although it still needs to be further refined, it offers an exciting new way to cultivate meat in the lab. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. You can follow 7 Days of Science on Instagram and TikTok, and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. As always, a big thank you to our patrons, including Andrew Kawam, Clara Middleton, Dean A. Baffer, Diana Hernandez, Dhruv Shubastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotist, John French, Joseph Rui, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Ralph Balzac, Robert Priyaprajika Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Voss, Schlom, Stanforth Hopkins, Steve Bradshaw, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy N. Tedrow, and Troy Schmidt. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.